a special welcome to you, especially if this is your first time, one of your first times here. Um, I, I hope that you will find that this is a community where wherever you're at, wherever you're at on your spiritual journey, um, you can find a way to take a step forward into, into the very best things that God has for you. Because I believe that God has good things for all of us, um, that God has an abundant life for us beyond what we've known so far, a life rich with purpose, with deep relationships, with uh, meaningful work. A life that is about more than just ourselves, but a life, a life in fact, that we, um, in which we're involved in the healing of all things and putting things the way that they ought to be, mending communities, bringing about justice, making beauty out of ashes. That's the sort of life I believe God has for us. And I think wherever we're at, whether we um, believe in God, we don't really know what we think about God, we pretty sure we don't believe in God, wherever we're at, I think that sort of life, that abundant life, that's... That's the sort of life that we want. That's the sort of life that we were made for, and it's the sort of life that we're just kind of oriented around, whether we kind of live into it or not. There's something fundamental about who we are as human beings. We're, we're pointed in that direction of this abundant life that God has for us. And so many of us here in this community, we've experienced that sort of life um, in Jesus. And so as a community at ECV, we are oriented around Jesus, following Jesus into the abundant life that God has for us. And so as I said, I, I hope wherever you're coming from this afternoon, whoever you are, I hope that you can catch a glimpse of that abundant life and, 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 and start to get a handle on um, kind of how, how to get that life, how to live into it. That this moment, this afternoon, is a step along the way. And let me just say... I actually believe that that is possible, perhaps especially this afternoon, because of what we're talking about. Because this afternoon, I want to share something with you that if we actually walked into it, if we actually decided to do this thing that we're talking about this afternoon, it would change our lives. I want to talk about the one practice that we most desperately need as individuals, as a church, as a city, as a culture at large, I promise you, as audacious as it might sound, if we did this thing, if we did this thing that we're talking about today, it would change everything. And we would be marked as kind of oddly wonderful people in our city. Right? People who actually have some sort of resource that our city desperately needs if we could learn to live into rest. And it's God's gift that God has for us. Um, it, rest, in, in the Hebrew, it's called Sabbath but Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, um, who I've been um, reading a lot of lately and kind of getting, getting into it, he has some really important things to say to, um, to, to folks who want to follow Jesus. Um, he, he, he said this, he said, if I ruled the world, this is the title of this piece he wrote, if I ruled the world, I would resign immediately. Um, it's hard enough individually and collectively to rule ourselves, let alone rule others. But, but... If I were offered an hour before I resigned, I would enact one institution that has the power to transform the world. It's called the Sabbath. It has the power to transform the world, he says. Why? Because there is very little, there is very little in our culture or in the brokenness of our hearts that wants us to live life at a reasonable pace. Let me re revise that just a little bit, sorry. There is nothing, actually, in our, culture, uh, in our culture or in the brokenness of our hearts that wants us to live life at a reasonable pace. There is a sickness in our culture, and in our city in particular, a sickness of life lived at an unsustainable pace. You may not... Maybe, maybe, you are, are you, maybe you're like one of the lucky few. This disease hasn't infected you. I, I won't add the yet. It hasn't infected you. Um, but even if that's where you're at, you are around it enough, right, where I think you'll be able to, to identify this. Oh, that's what's wrong with all these. I mean, that's what's going on uh, in the lives of all these people around me. We are surrounded by signs that we live at an unsustainable pace, that we are desperately in need of rest. There are the silly things. Our computers, our computers that are mil literally millions of times faster than the computers that put a man on the moon strike us as, like, just awfully slow. We like tear our hair out. We can't stand it. We drive like maniacs, cutting one another off just to get to the red light five seconds sooner, um, which is it's so, I mean, totally Sisyphusian in that case, but as if even if we could get through five, that five seconds would somehow change the world. Just some silly things, but there are more serious issues. 
often we find that we are exhausted all the time. We can feel like life is just happening to us, like it's out of our control. We find that we can't be present to the folks that matter in our lives. We're imminently distractible, checking our phones constantly to see whether kind of someone has offered a better deal than the person we're dealing, that we're interacting with right now via phone or text or email, or Facebook, all right, I can go on Twitter. We can't do just one thing at a time. I don't know if you've, if you've seen this website. This astonishes me that this exists. Um, do nothing for two minutes dot com. Um, if, if you haven't, you just go there sometime. The site just shows you this beautiful picture and plays the sounds of the ocean and counts down from two minutes. And if you touch your mouse or the keyboard, it says fail. And, be <laughs> and, and begins the count all over again. When this website was first released, um, Huffington Post did a, uh, did a survey of their readers, and 22% of Huffington Post readers reported that no matter how many times they tried, they couldn't do nothing for two minutes. They couldn't stop for two whole minutes. This is a sickness a disease, and what's worse, I, I learned quickly upon coming to Yale 17 years ago as a freshman that I was entering a particular subculture where actually you brag about having this disease. I soon found myself involved in perverse competitions to prove who was busier, who was more sleep deprived. Conversations like, oh man, I'm so tired, I only got like, I barely got like five hours of sleep last night, so his response was, you have five, I wish I could get five hours of sleep. I slept two hours last night. And then someone else like, two hours? I, I, I didn't sleep at all last night, are you kidding me? And then someone's like, I wish. I haven't slept or eaten anything in like 48 hours, right? <laughs> and it's just this like ridiculous one-upsmanship. And somehow people feel like they deserve a prize when they win this game. What they need is like something called 911, right? <laughs> um, Wonder how, it, anyway, it, once you're a parent, if you've been a parent, you have some idea that, right, like, there's a way to, like, win that game, and it doesn't feel like winning at all. Um, ask someone who has a newborn. This is a sickness, a disease, a disorder of our souls. I'm serious about that. We should be mourning when we hear from one of our friends, oh, man, I, I barely slept last night. Oh, breaks my heart. Can I pray for you? What's going on in your life? It's the enemy, this busyness is the enemy of that abundant life that I was describing, the abundant life that God wants for us. And if we want that life, and I think that we do, if we want the abundant life, then we just have to slow down. We just have to. There's no two ways about it, no way of getting out of it. We just have to learn to rest. And not just to cease activity for two minutes in order to pass a website's test. We need to learn to stop, to stop and rest. And in doing that, do that in such a way that the way that we view the world, the way that we view ourselves, and the way that we view God are all fundamentally transformed. And if we can do that, it'll change our lives. So that's, that's, that's where we're headed today, just a chance to talk about rest, to talk about the revolution that it can be in our lives. And so um, as, as we do that, I'd like to pray for us that God would come and speak to us. So if you would, if you join with me. Lord, we just say, you know, this, this stuff about rest, this is, this is not exactly our strong suit. In fact, this is exactly our weak spot. This is my weak spot, Lord. There's nothing in me that naturally wants to rest. But there is something in me that is, na that, that is just drawn to that abundant life that you offer. So, Lord, would you come and would you speak to us? Would you show us the, the good life that you have for us? Would you lead us into the very good things, the very best things that you have for us? Amen. So the, the, the rest revolution, as it were, for me, began several years ago, not long after our daughter, my, my wife Hannah and I, we have a daughter, Junia. It was not long after Junia was born. It was um, not a particularly restful season for me, as I already said. Kind of newborn child is not, um, it's not the time when you get the most sleep. 
But during, during that season, I listened to a talk um, that uh, was reckon, recommended to me by Josh. It was a talk given by one of our mutual friends, a guy named Jay Pathak, who leads a church out in Colorado. And you have to understand the context. Now, this, this talk was impactful, but you have to understand the context in which I heard this talk to understand exactly why it was so impactful. And during that season, every weekday afternoon, I spent some time with Junia, who was, uh, was seven months old at the time. One particular afternoon, I was, um, you know, being the exhausted, distracted, disease of the soul person that I am by nature, I was trying to figure out how I could multitask during my time with my daughter. Um, and I, she was, um, she was going to wake up, so I was like, oh, it's about time to figure this out. Because if you don't know yet, um, having, having children is like the, having a baby is the enemy of productivity. It's like the best way to make sure that you get very, very little done. And my, my, my calendar at that point was just full of like every afternoon, this like huge time, time slot that said, hang with Junia. That was how I marked it on my calendar. Still have some hang, hang with Junia slots. But at that point, there were many very large hang with Junia slots. And they just sat there on my calendar taunting me about how little I was going to get done, how unproductive I was going to be that I had to be extravagantly wasting my time with some little baby who, for the first months of her life, didn't know or care who I, who I was. Honestly, that's, that's how it goes. That's what the first couple months of, of, of parenting are. You kind of wonder, are they ever, anyway. Um, so Junia, as I said, was about to wake up from her nap, and so kind of being diseased in the way I was, I was starting to kind of think, all right, like, how am I going to make use of this time? What can I do? What else can I do while I have to be with her? And at that moment, I remembered, hey, I have that talk that Josh told me about. I, I, should go, I, should go listen. I should go listen to Jay's talk. That would be a good thing to do. I bet I can do that while giving Junia kind of the minimal amount of attention that I possibly could give her. And then, at the beginning of his talk, I had no idea what the topic of this talk was going to be. Jay was talking about the fact of our sickness as a culture when it comes to rest and pace of life. And he began his, his, his talk by, by telling this story about a guy um, whose wife points out, points out to him. She says, have you ever noticed that your son never just calls you dad? It's always dad, dad, dad. You're so distracted. You have so little time for our, for our children that you're, you're not dad. You're dad, 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 right? This is, how, this is how our children have learned they have to get in touch with you. And I'm, I'm sitting there multitasking with my daughter on the floor being ignored, busted. Cross-programming my time with her, this time that was quite obviously mislabeled, but we think we could say at this point on my schedule as casually hang with Junia. That was not what was happening. And so sitting in my living room, Hearing Jay's words continue as he describes my life and an inability to focus, to be present in ways that actually honor the people in my life in the way that I want to, and looking in my daughter, I'm, I'm in crisis, right? What do I do? I, I, I'm busted, but I'm also desperate, right? I need to hear the rest of this talk. And so praying, basically, I, at that point, I think praying for forgiveness as I did it, um, I downloaded the talk onto my phone and like put Junia in the stroller, and like we can take a walk. And at that point, there was no social interaction going to happen no matter what on the walk. So I was like, eh, this will be okay. I'll, I'll keep the earbuds in. We'll go do this walk. And as, as I'm walking and I'm listening to Jay's talk, God is present. And, and, I, and I'm, I'm like, I'm repenting as I'm listening to this talk, and tears are coming to my eyes. And, and Junia and I take like triple what our normal walk route was at that point. And as we got, get towards the end, we, were at, um, we came to Beaver Pond near our house, and Jay finishes his talk, and next on my iPod are these unbelievable pieces of concert music by my favorite composer of all time, Arvo Pert. And we're at the, we're at the pond, and the, and the geese are out in full force, and the sky, and the trees, and the crisp air, and, and the moment was just, was just pure joy. It was, it was rest, actually. We'd stumbled upon something, and from that day forward, my rhythms with Junia were transformed. I wasn't cross-programming my time with her anymore. We were taking that walk together every single day, experiencing rest together, encountering God together. It changed my life, not an exaggeration. 
And of course, the, the, the rhythms have changed as big structures of life have changed, as Junia has grown up and my life has changed. But that season of taking walks with my daughter was a turning point for me, a revolution of rest in my life. Suffice to say, at this point, I, I'm sold, right? I think God wants to give us rest, and this is a good thing for our lives. And if, for those of us who have any familiarity with, with God as he's described in the Bible, this shouldn't come as a surprise to us. Sabbath, rest, is a big theme in the Bible. Consider Psalm 127, verse 2. It says, It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. For God gives sleep to his beloved, to the ones whom he loves. It's because of God's love for us that he gives us the gift of rest. Or consider Jesus' famous statement in the Gospel of Mark, one of the ancient accounts of the life of Jesus. It says, the Sabbath, he, Jesus says, the Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind for the Sabbath. Often, I think, in at least where I've heard this talked about, often the emphasis is on the second part of this statement. But what about the first Sabbath is, in fact, God's gift to humanity. If you're wondering whether you qualify for this gift, so long as you're human, apparently, right, like you're in. This is a humanity-wide gift of God, part of what it is to live a flourishing human life that God has laid out from the very beginning. Rest is God's gift to us. Why do we so often refuse to receive it? Rest is God's gift to us, so why are we working so hard not to receive it? The answer, I think, has everything to do with our relationship to our work. The, the Sabbath um, features prominently in the Ten Commandments, the ten core things that, that God commands people to do so that they experience the abundance of life that he has for us. In fact, more time, more time, more space in the Ten Commandments is devoted to Sabbath and to the Sabbath commandment than to any other commandment in the list. If you know the list at all, there's some important ones there. Sabbath, right, gets the, gets the most airtime. The list begins this way. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no gods before me. He gets several commandments, and then a bit further down we read, Remember the Sabbath day the day of rest, and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the, ancient, uh, or the alien resident in your towns. Right? There are no loopholes. <laughs> this is a day of rest. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it, set it apart. So Sabbath is about a properly ordered rhythm of work and of rest. Specifically, one day a week we are to rest from our work. And it's not that work is a bad thing. The whole thing here, right, is modeled off of God's work. And presumably God's work in making the world, this was good work, right? It wasn't, God didn't repent at the, on the seventh day. This was good work. But work Work's goodness has to do with its proper relationship to, to properly ordered rhythms of work and of rest. This is why this commandment is given so much airtime more than any other commandment. After all, it's no accident that the passage begins with God identifying himself as the God who brought the people out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. This is who God is for them, a God who works and intervenes in the world for their good, and this is who God is also for us. But more, even more specifically, this God has freed them from slavery, freed them from a disordered, oppressive relationship to work. God has freed them from a place in which they were defined by what they could produce. He's freed them from a place in which they were defined by what they could pr produce, with their value was how many bricks they could produce each day. And so in response to this oppressive, disordered relationship to work, God places the Sabbath command at the heart of the Ten Commandments. And he says, don't define yourself anymore by what you can produce, by what you can accomplish. 
Define yourself rather in relationship to me, your God who loves you and gives you a rhythm of work and of rest as a gift to bless your life. Friends, I know we probably, many of us work in very different sorts of work environments, but I take it that this oppressive, disordered relationship to work is not too, too far from our own. Listen to what God has offered us. God has led us out of the slavery of Egypt, out of a life in which our worth was defined by what we could produce. Often, many of us still define our worth precisely that way. There was a time when we knew, we, we thought that's who we were. That's who we thought we were before God, before one another. And the powers that be may still operate as though this is the case. They may tell us that we are defined by our grades, our salary, our publications, our house, our car, our accomplishments in business, in school, in religion, in politics, or, or even in social justice and kind of winning the crunchier than thou competition. Or these powers that be may tell us that our worth is defined by our kids' grades, our kids' accomplishments, etc., etc., etc. Indeed, I think if we're honest with ourselves, we would have to admit that we once knew ourselves that way, or maybe still often think about ourselves that way, and we think about the world that way. But no longer, God says, God has led us out of this slavery to achievement and out of this slavery to accomplishment. He has called us sons and daughters. He has called us beloved, invited us to know ourselves that way. Let's not, like we read about in the Bible, pine away for the comfortable but oppressive life of slavery that we have known before. This is God's word for us today and from the letter to the church in Galatia. For freedom it is that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Let's receive the gift of God for us, a rhythm of rest in our lives that reminds us that our worth is not in our accomplishments, but in our relationship with a God who loves us extravagantly and without prerequisite. And I think that's key here. Ultimately, I think especially for those of us who share the particular sickness that I, I take it most of us share, Sabbath is God's tool to save us from a life defined by a disordered relationship to work. A couple of weeks ago, I was, I was at a, a church leadership meeting, and Josh had given us a passage from the Gospel of Mark and a list of questions to facilitate our reflection on the passage. And the passage included this really challenging statement of Jesus. He says, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the Gospel will save it. And one of the questions that Josh had asked was this. He said, in the upcoming season, in this upcoming season, the fall, how do you sense Jesus inviting you to lose your life? Now, as we were just talking about, you, you'll know that I'm just about to begin a semester-long sabbatical for ministry. So especially thinking in like the church context, I sort of thought, well, that's an odd question for me to think about. This one probably doesn't, doesn't apply to me. I should go on to another one. And in a certain sense, I wondered whether my sabbatical wasn't the opposite of the sort of death to self that Jesus is talking about, right? Maybe my sabbatical is, some kind of, my sabbatical is something kind of like a little bit of me time at the end of seven years of ministry. But as I, as I prayed, I just kept coming back to these verses. God kind of wouldn't let them out of my head. And I found myself asking, how, in fact, is sabbatical denying oneself? How does, how does Sabbath itself constitute losing one's life. And as I reflected, I found Jesus warning me that, that on my sabbatical, I would indeed experience loss of a certain sort. As I ceased, as I rested from doing so many things, that, uh, even good things, but so many things that have at various times threatened to define who I am, Jesus was saying, hey, get, get ready. Your sabbatical is going to be a refreshing time, but it's going to be a refining time. And whatever part of you still has a disordered relationship to work, especially to your ministry work, that part of you is about to die. And you're going to experience that as loss. 
And I think this is part of the cost of why, sad, why we don't receive this good gift. It doesn't seem like a good gift to us. It seems like sacrifice and loss, death to the self. But you know, I've become convinced that this is fundamental to all forms of Sabbath, fundamental to the sort of rest that God wants for us. In rest, we deny ourselves. That is a self that we've constructed on the basis of what we do, what we accomplish, that self dies. We lose that life. And in the process, we actually end up finding that Jesus' words are true. And that in losing that life, we actually find the abundant life that we're after. Everything broken within us seeks to save the achievement-oriented life that we have. But to save that life is to lose the life that we actually want. The life that we were actually made for. But willingly laying down achievement-oriented life in Sabbath rest results in saving, in rescuing the life for which we were intended. Do you see it? If you want to save that life, you're going to end up losing real life. But if you lay down what you're calling life, you will in fact save the real life you're after. Don't be deceived by the cost. There's real cost, but it's something we want to pay anyway. So let's get serious. Um, I believe, as I said, God, look, God is offering us rest. And, and you may be sitting there and you're thinking, boy, this is an awfully costly time of the year to be thinking about that, right? Like, um, I kind of was just resting the summer, maybe a little bit. Um, I'm getting back into the flow of things. Um, I'm really kind of freaking out. If you're like anything like me, kind of the beginning of September is kind of the put together my like awesome calendar of like how incredibly productive I'm going to be, how like how amazing my semester is going to be. Um, and and far be it from me to I, I don't want this like rest thing to become another part of that kind of like scheduling game where you're like. Oh, my, my schedule's going to be even more awesome this year because I'm going to slot in a few minutes to like rest. Um, but I think it is worth thinking about in advance. God doesn't just offer us rest. God, in fact, commands rest. In Exodus, or in, 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 the, in the Jewish law, the, command for, or the, the penalty for breaking Sabbath is death. Um, now, I... I I'm, I'm, I'm thinking we probably shouldn't go that way in terms of a communal practice here or communal policy. But um, I think there actually is something, right, like quite insightful about that. I, my hunch is, actually from, from my point of view, it seems like a kind of natural consequence, actually, <laughs> frankly. Um, I think many of us are maybe even living in that sort of death um, and we don't know about it. But this is a command that God has given us. And so I want to challenge you this week to take a risk and actually infuse your daily and weekly rhythms with life of rest with Sabbath. And, and just, to, just, to, just to, a note on that, the Bible actually talks about Sabbath on multiple time scales. I mean, it talks about Sabbaths, plural, on the scale of weeks, of months, of years. And so I think we have license here to think about rest on multiple scales. Um, a daily rhythm of rest, a weekly rhythm, seasonal retreats or vacations or once every seven years or so sabbaticals. Um, but, but I think we need to take a risk to actually do this, to rest. And my hunch is, as broken as we are, I warn you, this next slide is going to look a little bit silly. Um, we can all feel a little bit of, of shame, not shame, we can all feel a little bit of grief that this is a slide we need to see. But this is a slide I need to see, right? Um, uh, we, we don't know how to do this. <laughs> um, I, I think we actually need to learn, right, how I need to learn how to rest. And so these are some, um, just kind of some practical thoughts as I've been talking to people whose Sabbath practices are, are um, kind of deeper, more entrenched than mine, um, folks in this community and beyond it. Um, and just a few thoughts here, but these have been helpful to me and, um, and, to, and to others. I think we, yeah, we can use a lesson here. The first step, I take it, is simply to, to make kind of pre-made decision. Not a decision that you make like on the morning, like, huh, does this feel like, like, could I really take Sabbath today? No, make it ahead of time, right? Make space to rest ahead of time, not in the moment. It'll never feel like a good day to take a rest. Um, and that's not really the kind of rest we're talking about. We're talking about the sort of rest as a discipline that intervenes in your life and helps reorder it, reorder it a little bit. 
This is precisely not supposed to be the, oh, it would be convenient to take a day off today sort of rest. I really found my way into all of this, um, all this rest stuff on a, in, through a daily practice of walking with Junia, as I was describing. Um, it was redemption to a rhythm in my life that I wasn't seeing as a gift from God, but actually, and when I started kind of embracing it, I was like, oh, this actually, this is my competitive advantage. I get to like take a walk with a, a child who cares nothing about what I've accomplished or what I've gotten done today. That's a beautiful, like who else in my field is forced to do this every day? Um, this is brilliant, this is great, I love, I, I love this. This is my competitive advantage over the long haul. If you can find, I'm serious, if you can find a daily rhythm, um, and I, I highly recommend walking um, as a way to make that space. Walking is wonderfully wasteful, um, right? We have technology that can like convey you from one place to another more quickly. Um, and so it's, 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 a great, it's a great rhythm um, if, it's, if it's possible. Do it, it'll change your life. Now, Hannah and I have also, um, in various seasons, worked to reorder our lives to make room for a weekly 24-hour Sabbath. Um, and in, in different seasons, that's been on different days of the week. Um, as pastors, it's hard for that day to be Sundays, um, though it will be for me on my sabbatical. Um, some, sometimes we've taken Mondays or, or Saturdays. I think it was Thursday for a little time. You know, whenever it, it, it could happen. Um, follow, followers of Jesus for centuries have made Sunday their Sabbath day. Um, obviously the Jewish people, uh, Saturday is the day, whatever. I think this is, uh, I'm going to be a bit pragmatic here. Um, if, what, if it works for you, go for that. Regardless, my hunch is that you will need to find as um, you will need to find a, a time that it feels like it's at um, the the end of your work week. Um, whenever it feels like you've kind of completed your work, otherwise, um, what you intended as rest can feel a little bit more like procrastination. Um, as someone who's just fallen into that um, pit, I will just warn you about that. Um, don't do that. Um, but you're going to find, no matter what you do, that you're going to have to reorder your life a little bit, kind of, re like kind of reorganize some things and probably even drop some things out in order to accommodate 24-hour Sabbath. Um, my hunch is that's good because I don't think we're exactly like, we should be very suspicious if any of our Sabbath-following plans don't require a major overhaul to our lives. Because at least for me, like, my life is not the picture right, of a like, perfectly healthy, like, balanced life lived at a reasonable pace. So if we're trying to correct something, we're just going to need to involve some actual changes. All right. The rest of these will be faster. So you're getting impatient. It's OK. I am too. Um, second, this seems obvious, right? <laughs> just stop. Um, I found this actually helpful. The, the year after I graduated from college was a crazy busy year for me, actually. I was volunteering full-time with a ministry and working part-time to pay the bills, um, living in a crazy community house, preparing for a wedding, and more importantly, preparing for a marriage. Um, it was a very, very full year. But I remember one time that year in the spring, in the middle of everything else that was going on, something kind of drew me up to a kind of, uh, 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 it was up to, up to the third floor, a kind of corner of the house where I could find some peace. And I remember just collapsing in a chair and just being still for, I don't remember what it was, 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes, just, just stopped. And I wasn't planning. I wasn't even really reflecting. I just stopped. And the presence of God came on me to the extent to which, like, this is the extent that, like, 12 years later, I still remember this moment, right? Just a moment of just, of just ceasing, just stopping in the middle of everything that was going on. Um, just stopping, probably half the battle right there. Third, I'd encourage you, put achievement as far away um, as, as possible. Um, this is the slavery from which we've been set free. Let's not let our rest become another accomplishment that we can check off the list. We've talked about that already, um, but it's in, in important uh, to keep there. Fourth, um, let, let God come to mind. Um, and I say that exactly this way for, for a reason. Um, let God come to mind. This is where I think actually that Sabbath rest has been substantially different for me, and indeed I think it has succeeded for me in life in, in ways that quiet time or devotions, if you know what those kinds of frameworks are, have failed. And, um, quiet time as a concentrated effort to read the Bible and pray every day has always somehow slipped for me into the achievement category. Now far be it from me to dissuade you from reading your Bible regularly and praying. You should find ways to do that. But, but for me, somehow walking, Right? that kind of extravagantly wasteful activity, 
uh, in that space, God becomes present to me in ways that, that rival kind of all but the very best of my kind of quiet times or my Bible study times. There's something about just ceasing and allowing, waiting for God to come to you rather than even pursuing God becoming another task we take on. Next, uh, Chris, let relationships take their proper place. Um, one of the beautiful fruits of that daily walk was the way that it reframed my relationship with my daughter. And Sabbath should serve to reconnect us with the relationships that matter. And some of that may be by like taking, having a little bit of distance um, from certain relationships you need some distance from, that's fine. Um, but I think all, there are also are ways that, um, that, no, there are proper relationships that we ought to be investing in, in, in really restful ways and kind of reconfiguring our relationship by resting together which is the, certainly the only way that my last hunch makes any sense, which is, I think we should, we should party. Um, I think we, it's okay, it's good, you should party. Um, we should feast. And many of the Sabbaths, um, the plural Sabbaths that the Bible talks about are feasts, basically just huge divi divinely ordained parties. If you don't know that, you can look it up. It's true. God is constantly telling his people to party. And I've actually been working on something at work, reading all these rabbinic reflections on, it says we're supposed to do this with joy. What does joy mean? Like, how do we do that? Um, I, I, I could tell you some of the basic requirements, as far as they could tell, were, were meat, wine, and the marriage bed. But um, that was, um, but the point is, like, these are parties, right? Like, you should feast. You should enjoy Life. Our neighbors downstairs certainly have been an inspiration to me in this, this uh, uh, Orthodox Jewish family that lives downstairs from, from us. And so they take Sabbath really seriously, as you might expect. What you might not expect is what that means for them. There's two young girls in this, in this family, and essentially, as far as I can tell, we interact with them a fair bit and live upstairs. Um, Friday night, Sabbath. It's like a sleepover, like every week. It's awesome. It's like a slumber party. They get to have all their friends that live within walking distance, and they just have a party. Um, oh, beautiful. What a beautiful picture of Sabbath rest. I think that's not too far from the very core of what Sabbath is about, celebrating life with our friends, giving thanks to the creator who provides all good things. So that's it. Um, like I said, this week, let's, just, let's do it. Find, I encourage you, find a daily rhythm of rest, and at least this week, right, try it. See if you can find a 24-hour period of rest. Decide in advance to do it. It will be experienced as costly until it's experienced as, like, the very source of the life you've been chasing after. I think that's how life with God usually works, right? Incredibly, incredibly costly, and then exactly like what you were made for. All right. If we do it, it'll change our lives. Let, why don't you stand up? I'd like to pray for us. The worship team can come on up. I have just like one more, a couple more slides. Um, if, you, if you would, as we've, we've been talking about, this is a gift, and I would just encourage you, um, if, you know, as I pray for you, if, if you're comfortable, if you just extend your hands um, as, as we are receiving a gift from God, uh, we can receive together. Lord, I just, we just say, this is a gift, Lord. Rest. You offer it to those that you love. And too often, Lord, I know that I am one who is, who is just um, who is denying myself rest because of anxious labor, anxious toil. And so, Lord, we just say, um, would you give us this good gift? Would you help us receive um, and, and pay the costs that are associated would you give us the courage to deny that part of ourselves that just can't imagine kind of not being productive, not getting something done, not prove, proving our value to ourselves or to our boss or to the people that, whose respect we desire? Would you just set us free, Lord? Come, Holy Spirit, have your way in this place. Would you be setting us free? It is for freedom that you have set us free. Would you come and have your way in this place? I just encourage you to stay in that posture of prayer. Um, stay in this, in this posture of receiving. You know, one of the ways to summarize the activities of Sabbath is simply to say this. It's feasting and worshiping. Enjoying the creation and giving thanks to the creator. 
And for followers of Jesus, these two, worshiping and feasting, come together in communion. A meal, a feast, in which we give thanks to God for sending Jesus to model that sacrificial life that we talked about. To die for us. To make possible and to invite us into that abundant life now and eternally. So we're, we're going to receive communion together now and if you're a follower of Jesus or if you would like to begin following Jesus into the abundant life that he has for you, I would invite you to come forward and to tear off a piece of the bread, Jesus' body broken for you, and dip it in the cup, his blood shed for you. As the Apostle Paul said, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. So let us together keep the feast.